Hey Auto Squad, producer Dylan here with another re-release of Spider-Man Miles Morales. In episode 2, Guy in the Chair, which was originally released July 7th, 2021, we meet our friend Genki, try to name Miles' new power, and list some of her favorite sidekicks. So give it a listen and enjoy. Auto save. I'm Camille Salzar Hadaway, and here with me is my co host Nick Andrade. We take deep dives into some of the most talked about video games, and in this episode, we are continuing our playthrough of Spider Man Miles Morales. Last time, uh, we were first introduced to Miles Morales and saw him and Peter Parker take on the tough headed rhino. Through this brief beatdown, we learned what separates Miles and Peter, which is mostly experience and a venom punch. And we also met Simon Krieger, the owner of Roxxon and someone who is potentially the big baddie. After that, Peter decided it was the perfect time to take a long overdue vacation, well, a work vacation, leaving Miles on his own to protect Manhattan. We are going to swing into missions two to four, where we'll see if Miles will find his footing as the other Spider-Man. But first, how are you doing, Nick? Pretty good. I got to say, that is the best intro I've ever heard. That was just <laughs> so oh, sentimental a little bit, too. And I just feel like we're getting right into this. Simon Krieger, he's an asshole. Rhino, he's an asshole. <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> I know. It's like, okay, let's identify the assholes of the franchise. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, we get into And But you know what? That is very common in a lot of superhero things. It's like... Big baddie. This is them. They want, you know, the audience to know who to hate. And, um, you know, we'll get into it later. But yeah, Simon Krieger, you could hate him. Definitely. I wonder, actually, just thinking off the cuff, Simon Krieger just seems like a like a, a villain, obviously. But like Marvel's really, especially in the movie universe, it's got to be villains, but you can sympathize with them. But I still think in video games, it's still like, this is the bad guy. Yeah, you're right. I, I feel, especially with Miles Morales, I feel like it is, you know, you know who's good. You know who's evil. It's very black and white. There is no gray. However, maybe they'll switch that up with the first Spider-Man game. I think it kind of does set a tone for potentially where the second Spider-Man game will go. And that may actually see the villain, you know, that you could kind of understand their motives, but also hate them at the same time. So I feel like it, it's like a tier list of villains. You have the very basic villains where it's very black and white. You you just hate them. <laughs> <laughs> those guys those guys are usually like the dumb villains and they have like a New York accent and like, hey, Spider-Man, I'm going to kill you. Those are the like the, the surface level. Wait, were you just that was a really good rhino impression. Oh, <laughs> that's sorry, pretty much I'm... rhino, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, above them, we have the more elite uh villains where they're they're relatable, you know? They they kind of we could understand their motives. And then you have those villains that just are out of reach, you know, the Thanoses of all villains, where it's just like we understand them, but really, really you should know better. Like Joker is, I'm so crazy that I don't care what I do, right? Like there's motives, but it's like super crazy motives. Yeah. He'll define his motives through really crazy reasoning, which I don't think we see a lot of in Spider-Man. Yeah, that's true. I got to say <laughs> this past week, I've been really meditating about this a lot. I'm starting to dislike Peter a little bit. <laughs> Gosh, firstly, when you said meditating, I just picture you with a shrine of miles, um, you know, you sitting in front of the shrine, candles yeah. lit, focusing your energy towards the dislikement of Peter Parker. What is it about Peter Parker that you don't like? Okay, I can't say this because he's still, I mean, up until a week ago, he was my favorite Marvel character. But thinking about it lately, I think he has it out for miles. Now that I think about it, I think he's slightly, and I, I might get into this in the second mission, but a little teaser here, I think that he might want to make sure that Miles is second fiddle to him. Oh. 
subconsciously. And that's why it's it's hitting me a little bit in the wrong way. Oh, so it's like a subconscious thing. Peter is not completely aware of it, but he's doing it. It's kind of like, you know, um, when you're... I don't know where this example is coming from because I wasn't the best at basketball as a kid, but when you're like the all-star player, you know, and then there's a newbie kid that hops off the bench and then you're benched. I definitely resonate with being benched playing basketball as a kid, but oh, you know, sorry. that Did feeling of being, something here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. let's dive deeper into Camille's trauma. Um, yeah. I was benched as a kid. No, but that, that feeling of being replaced, right? We actually don't get a sense of that really through the first bit of game. You know, we see Peter going off on vacation and we just think this is an opportunity for Peter to get away because now he has someone to sub in. But maybe he's feeling like he should be irreplaceable. The right? top dog. Yeah. Hugh, Hugh Beyonce song right there. Irreplaceable. <laughs> um, I don't think we have the rights to that uh, one. No, we don't. Don't sing no. it. Don't sing it. But no, those, those are very real feelings that I wonder if we will explore at a later date. I know that you're going to talk about it when we get into the missions, but I look forward to that conversation. Actually, while playing through the game, I realized that we have something in common with Miles, Peter, and all those other superheroes out there. Do you know what that is, Nick? What is it, Camille? We both have sidekicks. We are ah. each other's sidekicks. Oh. Yes. Wow. Thank we you. We support and cheer each other on. <laughs> Plus, we even have our own quirky banter. I agree. We just literally did. You know, we unlocked your your uh, whole basketball. Maybe you had bad experiences, <laughs> trauma, trauma <laughs> earlier in life where you were benched on the basketball team. So we unlocked these things because, again, we're there for each other. You know? We have each other to lean on. Yes. But who <laughs> is the sidekick? brainy sidekick and who is the muscle is what I want to know. I'm the brainy sidekick. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, every superhero, I'm not saying we're superheroes, but I mean, we're kind of like superheroes, has a sidekick that's on standby and Miles is no different. We're going to be introduced to Genki and we're going to also call him the man in the chair. We're going to go into that a little later, but on top of the playthrough, we'll be looking at Genki and Miles's relationship and the common superhero trope of the man in the chair. Oh, hey! <laughs> Dude, I am so filling your suit with snow. Are you still wearing your suit? Yeah, you know, just in case. <laughs> the sidekick figure is such a common theme in Spider-Man and anything superhero, really. How do you feel about Genki kind of stepping into the chair or sitting into the chair? I guess you can't step into a chair unless you sit with both feet up like I do sometimes. We're intro to Genki and we realize very quickly that he is filling the trope of most sidekicks where he's very brainy and he seems to know everything and he's super smart, which again, most, I would say a lot of superheroes are super smart, but their sidekicks kind of have that little different side of them where they can help them in, in a certain way. But uh, especially in the Spider-Man universe, it seems like a lot of people are super geniuses and Genki is one of them as well. Yeah, let's talk about that for a sec because it's in order... To, okay, the superhero checklist must be super smart or super buff, right? Strong like Hulk, although Hulk gets stronger and smarter later on Smart Hulk. <laughs> yeah. But you also need to not be smart enough that you could do it on your own, but you need someone to help. <laughs> right, exactly. And like you said, Spider-Man's riddled with that. There's so many characters that just have labs for some reason or have access to labs and then they just go and whip up a new formula. <laughs> I, I understand that they all have to be super geniuses, but again, the technology that they have in superhero movies, comics, whatever, it's unreal. I wonder if there's, you know, sometimes you think maybe the U.S. military, they have those, you know, billion dollar fighter jets. Are they actually like maybe like the X-Men um, no. <laughs> aircraft that they have? I forget what it's called, but like what technology is really out there? But these super geniuses and they're high schoolers. I mean, I almost failed grade nine French. I don't know how these kids do it. <laughs> we'll have to get into Genki and like managing everything he does because he does so much. So does Miles. But yes, they're usually they're around the same age of the hero. In this case, you know, Genki's same age. But then you also have some sidekicks that are older. You have Alfred, you know, who is Batman's sidekick. You also have... 
sidekicks that mirror Miles and Genki. Interestingly enough, you know, there's another Spidey sidekick out there that's very similar. What was that? Uh, nothing, nothing. You're the Spider-Man from YouTube. I'm not, I'm not. You were on the ceiling. No, I wasn't. Ned, what are you Tony Stark made you that? Are you an Avenger? I love it. Are you an Avenger? <laughs> that's so great. Genki and Ned obviously are very similar I feel like Kevin Feige and the whole MCU crew just loved Genki so much. They ripped him out of Miles Morales and was like, there, <laughs> he's Peter's Ned leads, okay? He's Peter's sidekick. And you know what? Actually, it's not even that just fans observe that similarity. The writers and creators of comic books in Spider-Man number 236, written by Brian Michael Benendez, Genki goes on a date with Danica, who's also in the game. Uh, who is a Spider-Man vlogger. And he actually tries to hide his identity by using the name Ned. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's a cute little, yeah. It's, yeah, it's eventually, you know, revealed that, you know, Ned's not his name and his name's Genki, but it's a cute little nod to the MCU Ned and for the comic book to be like, we see you, MCU. <laughs> we see what you did there. It's basically Genki, Ned's character, right? And they needed that kind of sidekick. I know we talk about, we mentioned Alfred, I, I don't think we're we're saying necessarily like if you think of Batman's sidekick, it's Robin. We're not talking about that type of sidekick who also fights crime. We're talking about kind of the people that the man in chair who takes a back seat and is behind the scenes, you know, kind of helping them or, or, or giving them a call and saying, Batman or Spider-Man, there's a villain at so-and-so street. Go get him, blah, blah. That's what we're talking about specifically. The same is Barbara from the Arkham Games, who yes, is Oracle. the man in chair, the woman in chair. Yeah. And she is super smart as well. They all have that certain trope about them where they can help them on an intellectual level and somehow have all this technology where they know how to use it and can tell Spider-Man or Batman where they are at all times. It's pretty interesting. It is pretty interesting. And it kind of makes sense. I feel like I can't keep a secret for the life of me. I'm pretty sure, you know, Nick, I don't know how you are <laughs> at keeping secrets, but I feel like superheroes, they have so much going on. It is very hard to keep that as a big secret. They have to tell someone who's not also fighting crime. They need that shoulder to lean on. But what happens is most of the time, they get in trouble for knowing that information, right? A <laughs> villain true. finds out that they're best friends and then tortures <laughs> the sidekick yeah. as grim as that sounds. Yes, which, but it makes for really good story arcs that I mean, I will soak up any day. Yes, I would too. All right. So we are going to obviously continue looking at that man and chair figure throughout the episode. After the break, we're going to jump into some gameplay. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Auto Save, and let's continue our adventure by unpacking Mission 2. Yo, Genki. Dude. Rhino? What? <laughs> yeah. Where you at? You get into the apartment okay? Yeah. Your mom let me in. Unpacked slash dumped my stuff all over your floor. And now I'm in the park. Grabbing some air. Oh, perfect. All right. So in this mission, we are finally on our own. Peter is gone. And the first thing Miles does is call his BFF to freak out about Miles going against Rhino and other <laughs> Spidey stuff. This is so relatable. Yeah, it's so genuine just seeing their relationship. You know, you're always going to amp up your best friend. And again, this is what I love about this relationship is, you know, they support each other really well. And it's not fake. And it's not like if you ever had a famous celebrity friend, like I feel like I'd still be cool, you know? I wouldn't be like trying to like ride on their coattails. And I think Geki really is like, oh, dude, he's genuinely happy that Miles just be Rhino. But like you mentioned, you would try to be cool about it. Like, OK, cool. You're Spider-Man. Uh, Miles isn't uh, sorry. Geki is in total freak out mode yes. over Miles just because honestly, I feel like that would be the coolest thing to find out your friend is a superhero and like that kind of sets aside the burden for me, you being a superhero. If you wanted to, you don't have to go into the line of danger. You just sit in the chair, 
and you give them the tips. I actually would like that role. Oh. Yeah, I don't think I would want to be the superhero. Okay. That's a lot of exercising. That's a lot <laughs> of, you know, flipping. <laughs> but that all comes naturally because you have the superpowers, right? That is true. So you don't true. really have to work on it that bad. That is true. I guess maybe I would need a trial run of being a superhero. Like if the spider bit me, I'd be like, hey, is this good to return in 14 days? You know, um, <laughs> can I return this power? And instead, just be the sidekick. I have the opposite feeling because for me, I'd love to be Spider Man, and I definitely go full force. Because I remember eight years old, nine years old, you know, flipping everywhere, trying to pretend I was Spider Man. Like these are my dreams come true. So I definitely pick Spider Man. I couldn't be the sidekick because I'd be jealous a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't like show it, but in my heart, I'd be like, man, I wish I got that attention. Oh, uh, that's true. <laughs> but then there's usually a common comic book trope that at that point, the sidekick becomes a new hero, right? So then usually by the time you're jealous, you would become your own hero. So right. you'd be okay. good. So in this mission, what do we see, Nick? Um, so Spidey Miles is flying through the city, going to Central Park, and he's going to meet up with Genki in Central Park because he's given a gift uh, from Peter. We don't know what that is. Okay. How's it looking? Whoa. Miles Morales, congratulations and welcome to your very first super suit. So Miles gets a new suit and I love that <laughs> Miles actually hides behind yeah, randomly placed cardboard boxes in the middle of a park <laughs> um, to put on this quote super suit that Peter left him. What were your thoughts on, firstly, the <laughs> randomly placed cardboard boxes? I don't know who was packing or unpacking there. That's exactly what I was going to say, but would you, I don't think I would get fully butt naked in Central Park in New York. I think if, if you've been to Central Park, you know that you, you cannot do that because <laughs> there are just too many people around or like some sort of person that's sitting on a bench or laying or sleeping on a bench that's going to find your naked parts. I know Genki's trying to shield and he, def <laughs> he defends Miles there and he's like, you never seen someone changing in New York before, Central Park before? Uh, the classic New Yorker there, like, what are you looking at? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to see. I couldn't trust it at all. No, you couldn't. But okay, so I have a theory here because we'll get into like our thoughts of the suit, but the suit kind of looks a little bulkier. Like maybe Miles is wearing the other suit underneath it because then what happens to his original suit, right? So I'm just going to stick with the theory that he didn't actually get, you know, undressed. He just dressed over. <laughs> oh, so he's got two suits on. Yes. It, it's it's cold. It's winter. I mean, he needs all the insulation he can get. <laughs> yeah. It's like his tights. He has a full body of tights underneath his tights. Exactly. Yeah, that must be very, very uncomfortable. It's like wearing elastic bands. Yeah, more tights underneath. Would you think it's also uncomfortable to get an AI? Because integrated in this suit, there's an AI, a really cute animation that, for me, has the humor of the Spider-Man franchise kind of bundled into it. I, I think even in the subtitles when you're playing this part and, you know, the animated Peter Parker reveals the suit. There is like quoted cheese horn noises because he's like, boo, 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 super suit, um, which is really cute. I enjoy that. Again, this is the whole thing with Peter is I have this love and hate relationship with him now where this is a really cute thing to do. But he also gave him what it seems like a hand-me-down suit, which is telling me again that he doesn't want to be outshadowed by Miles. So he gives him a hand-me-down to show like, oh, this isn't the real Spider-Man. His suit is all floppy and and kind of, you know, over it's it's too um big for him or something like that. So I don't know. That's just my thought. Who puts elbow and knee pads on a superhero suit that is like the opposite of cool? And the Spider-Man suit that Peter Parker has is really cool. He made that himself. So wouldn't he he has Obviously, great design aesthetics. 
why not place that onto Miles' suit? You make a really good point. And see, now that you mentioned the elbow and knee pads, because I forgot about that, is it like Peter trying to tell him like, oh, Miles, you a baby. <laughs> There's also probably Band-Aids in the um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> web shooter <for> dispenser <laughs> that Miles could just pull out and, you know, yeah. <laughs> place on any, you know, little cuts that he has. That's, oh, poor Miles, man. That... But, you know, Miles is all innocent, thinking that the suit is the best thing ever. Do you think Miles is just... Miles has style. He does. I feel like Miles is fully aware that this isn't the greatest suit. It's just an honor to receive this by, <laughs> you know, the known <laughs> Spider-Man. And I will be nice and say it's really cool. Okay, now I'm thinking to myself, are we being too jaded with the world <laughs> that we're thinking there's... It seems like she's excited about it, but we think that there's some underlying issues here. But it's true. It doesn't look fashionable. So why is he excited? And Miles is all about fashion. You know, he had the Jordans and then here he has the Adidas bootleg thing. <laughs> but he also like I don't understand how the pull on gloves. OK, the suit has pull on gloves. I'm sorry to complain about the suit, but when did we have to see Spider-Man ever take off his gloves to access anything? Why do they need to be pull on? Your, your theories are just hitting home that I think subconsciously Peter may actually not be too thrilled about the new Spider-Man. See, this is what happens when we unpack and we play the game so many times that we start to overthink yeah. everything. And now we're starting to see a pattern. We overanalyze yeah. everything. Um, from this point, we actually see Miles leave Genki in the middle of a park, which honestly, you couldn't give your friend a ride home, like just whip him home. Right. I, right. I, I wondered that. Also, like <laughs> just <laughs> thinking of Genki in the air, hugging Miles yes. as he goes by. It just seems funny to me. It's the best bromance. Um, so we see Miles leave Genki to get the other half of the gift that Peter left him. And this leads into mission three, the new flip. Now this mission gives players a chance to swing across Manhattan in their new suit while Miles heads to a location to unwrap his next gift. Surprise, the location is a rooftop with a computer that has access to Peter's holographic training. Miles, get ready for your first holographic training challenge. These challenges are spread throughout the city. Each one focuses on a new move or technique. This one focuses on acrobatic improvisation. Get into position to start. Hollow training? Oh, I am so down. Yes, training for a gift. Is ho is that a good gift? I think it is. I, I imagine you're a 16-year-old kid, and it's like these dummies that come alive, and, you know, there's this giant computer telling you what to do. I think it's pretty cool. That one, I'll give Peter credit for this one. I think, in my opinion, it's pretty cool. That's true. He could have had, you know, Miles open up a book and, you know, have hand drawings of this is how you flip. This is how you you punch an enemy this in the face. You, uh, this, I think we created a new song there. <laughs> this is how you flip. This is how you thwip. Oh, God. Okay. This is horrible now. Look what we started. Oh, God. Bad, bad, bad. Um, but yeah, no, I was coming from the perspective that that's like going, you know, leaving school and your parents saying, I have a really cool gift for you, a new textbook. <laughs> so for me, I wasn't too thrilled about the holographic training, but you're right. It was fun because you go up against some bots and you learn about combos, swing attacks, you fight different types of goons. How is your time going through this? I really like this because when I go through fighting games, especially, I'm going to give the example of Arkham Asylum or the Arkham games in Batman. It's very, although there's stealth, it's very almost like button mashy. And I felt like this game did a great job trying to teach the audience how to do these combos more often. And I found this really helpful because then I started doing it where normally I, I button mash this time. I really took the time to do these combos, do these different things. And I thought it was really helpful. Yeah, you're right. I feel like obviously we're still in tutorial phase. We're learning um, about the different combos, like you mentioned, but it's very easy in this game to button mash just because of how the buttons are laid out and the movesets are, you know, you have those combinations where it's like square, square, X. So, so it's like, it's really easy to uh, button mash. So this was really great to see how you could go through it 
with more of a purpose, uh, go through every battle. My favorite part is obviously just the air launch. I think air launch is such a cool move that Miles has, and Peter does it as well. But it's just really cool to see enemies being thrown however high into the air. How often do you use that move? Because I can't say I use it that often because I forget about it. Mm -hmm. But when I do use it, I'm like, oh, I forgot about this. This is amazing. I use it quite often um, just because I find it's the easiest way to continue connecting all your combos. So to try to get a longer combo, um, you just throw someone up in the air and then you swing to them and then you beat them up a bit and then you throw someone else up. So it kind of allows you time to dodge any attacks as well. Yeah. So that was really cool for me. What do you feel about these iRobot type bots? Oh Yeah, they do look like iRobot bots. You're right. <laughs> I didn't think about that. They're very iRobot-esque. Yeah, it's cool to go through combat challenges with these guys, which is what happens after this mission, right? It, that you unlock the combat challenges, which is all with the AI robots. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they are what they are. I don't know how it works exactly. This technology I'm still confused with. I didn't know we had this technology in real life, and I would like to obtain it somehow so I could use it for my own purposes that I will not discuss. Well, that sounds creepy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't I mean it that way. I want to know what those purposes are, <laughs> but... <laughs> I know you're not being creepy. I need people to play Among Us with. Yes. That's what I need them for. Yeah. Okay. No, that would be really <laughs> weird playing Among Us, but they try to make it look more realistic because they have like those stands that are projecting the robots. I just don't know how the projection actually hits you. It's interesting how that all works, but it's pretty easy. I feel like this whole first tutorial in, you know, the holographic chamber, if you will. For me, when we unlocked those combat challenges, that was really exciting because then you're like, oh, it's going to get a lot more difficult. And there were quite a few combat challenges and some of them I feel like are very challenging. When you unlock the challenges, did you do them right away? Because I know in the first Spider-Man game, I did all the side quests at the start before I even got through most of the missions. This time around, I did the opposite, where I did all the combat challenges near the end, except for the first one that was already at that station. That's the first one that I did. Oh, okay. Yeah. I did it all off the bat. Like I did all my side missions um, off the bat just because it was, it's so much fun swinging around as Miles. It's like, I didn't want it to end. So I was putting off the story as long as possible oh. until like they kind of put that indicator like you must go here and it, it becomes annoying and you're like, okay, I guess I'll continue with the story if I have to. But yeah, you know, you get a sense of like what kind of weapons that some of the enemies will have also when you're going against these bots, which is really cool because then you could actually pull the weapons off the enemies a la Spider-Man, classic Spider-Man style, which which, you know, any moment you the game gives you to play through as like that classic Spider-Man experience, I'm I'm already sold. I specifically remember the first combat challenge that is at this spot in the mission, which is obviously you you take you use R1 L1 and you swing around and use objects to hit your opponents. And I spent two to three hours trying to get the ultimate, which is the highest tier. Because I didn't want to give up. And I was so frustrated because one of the first times I got 49 out of 50 and I couldn't recreate that. So I was just getting pissed off and I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And I realized the strategy with that, with this certain one, was you just bring all the dummies in as close as possible and then use your swing around to get as many hits against them as possible and then use the electrical vents or whatever. Use that to electrocute them, which makes them stand still. And then you do it again. And then that's how you unlock it and get the ultimate. It took me a long time to figure that out, <laughs> but I did it. But now you have it ingrained in your memory. I just see. I don't know if it's a good thing, though. Talking about it, you're just like, it's like this and this and this. You just have it down to a T, which is awesome. But yes, definitely frustrating. Here as well, we also get a sense of Peter outside of being Spider-Man, you know, in the first game, yes, we get a sense of his humor, but I feel like through Miles Morales, we really get a sense of Peter's humor and that charm because of how he's setting up the jokes through the holographic training. I really enjoyed that, seeing that side of Peter when he's not even really there. This is why like Spider-Man, he is one of the most entertaining superheroes because Peter's, you know, comic relief is so good this is why a character like Deadpool is so 
you know, popular as well because they're almost similar in that sense yeah. where they can make these jokes and they're not stern and serious or angry all the time like Wolverine or like, you know, thoughtful all the time like Professor X. He's just, you know, they are what they are. They're just a real genuine person. And he really shows on this. It, it does. And, you know, even for a super genius, he's relatable <laughs> because yes. his tech also f- flakes out at the end. He glitches. <laughs> yeah. The holographic Spider-Man glitches. So I like that yeah. little uh, nod to, his, you know, saying Peter's great and all, but he's still not perfect. Obviously, after this holographic training and mastering this masterclass, Miles heads into mission four. We are here for you, but not without a quick call from his friend Genki. Hey, so I want to hear more about your new spider powers. I think it's some kind of bioelectric discharge or supercharged static electricity. Ooh, we got to name it. How about venom power? You know, because it stings. (laughs) Okay, that's not bad. I'm going to run. Plaza first, then home. Remember, Venom Power. Trust me, it's gold. There you have it. Finally, a name for Miles. Special bioelectric discharge. Honestly, (laughs) thankfully, Miles wasn't left to name his power. (laughs) That would have been really uncomfortable. It's my special bioelectric discharge. Uh, When you say it like that, I I read it 8 million times and heard him say it, but when you said it specifically, it's really dirty. I don't know. That's uh, that's gross. I mean, Miles is so innocent. Didn't even see where that could go wrong if he was screaming, bioelectric discharge, go! (laughs) Um... (laughs) <laughs> in the streets of Manhattan. <laughs> but I love the fact that Miles isn't completely sold on Venom power either. Well, you know what's confusing is in the first mission, it shows Venom power as Venom power. But then Genki says it afterwards. Why didn't they just name it bioelectric <laughs> discharge to start and then introduce it as Venom power? Because then we already knew it was Venom power and then it was just weird. Yeah, it was. They're already talking about it. So, okay, the, the question is, Venom Power over Bioelectric Discharge and Super Static, what does he say, Super Static yeah. Power? Super <laughs> Static Power, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely the better choice, right? So, <laughs> I came up with a list here for you oh. of alternate names. Okay. I would like to, um, you can tell me which is your favorite ones. First, we have Electric Webinators. I do like the Webinator. Anything with Aider, I do like. And then, so I was searching up spider names, like, or sp- things that spiders do on spider Wikipedia and, you know, just Google, whatever, in general. And a lot of them came up with that spiders make their own milk. So I came up with Electric Milk. What do you think about that? Definitely not. Milk? <laughs> What <laughs> discharge milk? Where are we going? <laughs> oh yeah, I don't, I don't know where we're going with that. So I'll move on quickly with that. <laughs> then I got thunder fangs. Thunder fangs which isn't, bad. isn't bad, but I see this is my this is my kind of gripe with venom power. The inspiration is a snake. It's not spider snake. It's not snake man, right? Right. So I'd pass on that one. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, pincers. They have pincers. pincers my bad. Yeah. So uh, thunder pincers. pincers. That just sounds <laughs> weird. Um, and then my final one, which is my favorite one, is eight-legged electrocution. Ooh. What do you think about that one? Eight-legged electrocution. Or maybe I was trying to come up with something better. I couldn't. Those were actually pretty good. <laughs> it's hard you. to think of something on the spot. Pincher powers Ooh, would that's be a nice. really good one. I like that. But then you miss the like thunder of it, right? The roar of it. He will leave the name decisions to Genki because obviously we're not great <laughs> at it as well. He's the super genius, right? So he knows what he's talking about. He is. And he's also the man in the chair. And in this mission, he actually sends... Miles to check on Roxon Plaza because there's a robbery happening over there. And from there, through obviously um, exploring this potential break in that's happening, you learn that Simon Krieger, he has a new form reactor. And that's pretty much Roxon's answer to clean and safe energy that can help power Harlem. Wow makings of a bad guy there's got to be like it all sounds too good to be true that it's clean supplying clean energy to harlem there's got to be an ulterior motive here 
He's evil. Exactly. And they go through this little uh, demonstration video. Yeah. That's like, firstly, (laughs) Simon Krieger just has a really punchable face. Like they're setting you up from the start of the game to just want to throw a fist at Simon Krieger because (laughs) he just doesn't care. Right. And he says all these weird things um, that just are triggers. So they have this whole presentation where he's just making these fake smiles and he's talking about the new form reactor powering Harlem for over, you know, 500 years. It's just so outrageous. They're really setting him up to be a baddie. I love the whole punchable face thing. I <laughs> I love it too that he is he is that billionaire that always says, "Oh, you know, I don't have time to, you know, wear suits. You know, I just like to wear my jumper and my jeans and cuz I'm I'm a real guy, you know. I you you can relate to me." Yeah. I'm relatable. But then he also wants everybody else in the office to make sure they're suited cuz only he doesn't have to wear the suit. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> No, I just wanted to mention something specifically with the man in chair and Genki is how does he just all night sit at his chair looking like listening to the police radio to be like, there's a robbery on 23rd and 15th. Can you go there right now, Spider-Man? I guess it's like his background music because, you know, we're going to learn that he has quite a few projects going on. So maybe while he's working on those projects, you know, he's at his computer and instead of listening to Beyonce or, you know, Taylor Swift, I don't know why these are the only examples I could think of right now, but they are. (laughs) They're both great. They're both great. Don't worry. They are both great. Um, He just puts on the police radio. And he listens to whatever's happening there. And then he's just very efficient with his time. So total props to Genki. I completely understand how he does it. Don't you sometimes have like an audiobook on while you're working? Oh, actually, you want to get into this? Sure. I can't. I can't multitask. Oh, really? I can't. I can't multitask. So if I put on a podcast... I either pay attention fully to the podcast and not what I'm doing and vice versa. I can't, it, I just, it blocks out. I'm a horrible multitasker is what I'm telling you. <laughs> oh my God. But that means that you're just super focused on detail, which is really great. I'm a multitasker, but sometimes if I'm listening to an audiobook or a podcast, I do have to rewind if I'm deep in thought with whatever I'm typing. So props to Genki because we know he's multitasking a lot in this. Uh, we also get a sense of some of the other baddies that we're going to see as Miles is attacked by someone that has like the this new technology, these new baddies, which is pretty interesting. What is that? I call them big hands. I'm not really sure if they're... <laughs> the big hands. The Hulk hands? Yeah. And they can bring out their guns with some sort of technology. I don't know. It's weird. I don't exactly know what this technology is. It's just purple and... It's beautiful. It's very purple. Very purple. Uh, very beautiful. And actually quite, I, I found this battle, although, you know, it's still near the tutorial phase, so it's not too difficult. It did have its challenges just because the big hands actually block your punches. So you have to make sure that you're timing everything right. And when you have other enemies also coming from you from all different sides, it can be a bit troublesome. I noticed specifically... This is my first time thinking, okay, this game is a little harder on normal mode than usual. It, you, you definitely need to think about what you're doing and how you're reacting because there are little consequences, whether it's gunshots, you know, the bigger, the big hands coming after you, regular punches, whatever. You have to be aware of your surroundings at all times. And that is going to be useful as you go through the game. You have to be aware of surroundings. I think it's a huge a takeaway from this game. Now, after this beatdown, obviously Venom Punch complete or Powers and Punch completely wrecks all these enemies. And we find out that they're tracking a new form shipment, which makes it interesting because it opens up the door that we're going to be dealing with these baddies for quite some time. They look like the the main villains of this game i think yeah just judging by that first part of it it looks like the demons from peter's first spider-man game were the main villains mostly apart from like doc ock or whatever but that was near the end of the game and these guys seem like again the same sort of gang or or group that have some sort of motives that we don't know about that seem like they're gonna be you know bothering you for a long time and and that's what makes things a lot more interesting Um, Now, after the break, we are going to give our final thoughts about these missions on Odyssey. Get ready for 
a planet powered by New Form. Roxxon, we're here for you. And like Roxxon, we are here for you. We're going to give you our thoughts on the missions we covered this episode and try to hold back the fists that want to just punch Simon Krieger's face. So punchable. Ugh. So punchable. Uh, but Nick, what were your overall thoughts on the missions that we covered? Again, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Uh, nothing too hard to deal with. Just starting to really understand Miles and Genki's relationship together as best friends um, and starting to know Miles a lot more now that he's on his own, what he's capable of. And he's pretty competent. Yeah, I, I, we're really, you know, I feel like last episode we were getting a sense of Miles' abilities and what he will be capable of. Now we're seeing examples of that, you know, as he goes in with confidence, exploring Roxxon. Like, I feel like if I were new to being a spider man or, you know, spider woman, I would have went into Roxxon, like, knocking on their door, be like, hey, is it okay if I just check in to see if there's a break in? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I don't know the formalities fully, but you know, he just goes in there. He already has his investigation hat like on and he's looking at all the clues. Um, he has that confidence, which I really like. I guess this is why when you said you wanted to be in Genki shoes, this is maybe why, because you were going to knock on the door and ask, hello, let me in. Can I investigate, please? Yeah, I would tip <laughs> off, you know, any like baddies that are in the building. I'd be like, hey. Anyone there? If you're robbing in here, please just just leave. That's not cool. But I did find, again, like the previous missions that we've encountered, this was pretty easy. Yeah. More difficult, I would say, than the tutorial phase in the first Spider-Man game with Peter. I feel like, you know, what Insomniac is doing here, they know that they know that everyone's that played Miles Morales has probably played the first Spider-Man game. So they kind of know what's up and they're just amping up a little bit on the tutorial, making it go by really quickly, which I enjoyed. It's not drawn out at all, but it's still interesting to play through. It doesn't just seem like a walk in the park that you're going to just be bored. The first mission left me really sweaty after uh, the amazing plot points that were going on. And this one really just eased me into it. And again, it was pretty straightforward and it really helped uh, mechanic wise to kind of see where this game is going. And I think the tutorial phase was was on point. How long did uh, these few missions take you? Because I feel for me, it wasn't too long, but it was hard to track because I was doing side missions. I think <laughs> I think it's around the same thing from mission two to four is around the same time as mission one. So it's a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. I think it all added up to around like 20 minutes, but you get through it really quickly other than there's obviously the cutscenes a little bit. Uh, that drags it on, but yeah. it, it it doesn't take too long at all. Because this, again, is a very relatively short game in general. It feels like mm -hmm. its own epic, but it's still really compact. Yeah, exactly. And you, you said that you did do the combat challenges your first time through, right? Or was it the second time through? No, I only did, sorry, I only did the first combat mission right when we were at that point in the mission. And then I left everything until the end. Oh, the end. Till the yes. end. That's right. Okay. Yes. So then you really had the true experience of following the story. Unlike myself, who was just like, I don't want it to be over with. I think that's the smarter way to do it because... And a lot of times with video games that I have is if you play the main missions off the hop, you don't end up going back to the side missions because you've beaten the game. And then you're like either on to the next thing or, oh, I got to beat these challenges. But then it becomes really repetitive. So if you do play it in the beginning, I think that's smarter because then you, you know, unlock whatever the platinum trophy easier because you can go back to it because you still have the main missions to play. So Good job, Camille. That was the right way to do it. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're being a great sidekick right now. <laughs> but no, honestly, you you do bring up a point, and that's why I choose to play that way, just because I find, especially if you're with a map like this where you're all across Manhattan, I try to do anything that's unlocked around me, just because as soon as you go through the story or you get to a point where you have almost all the abilities unlocked, it seems very menial of a task and kind of boring and, and just as it seems like a task to kind of go back. Whereas for me, when I'm playing through and doing all these challenges on the side, as I try to progress through the story, 
it's more like, okay, this is just like, I'm, I'm miles. I'm actually miles. These are side things that come up in his every day. I'm feeling what it would be like to be miles. Now let's revisit actually, because we talked about this throughout the episode so far, the man in the chair dynamic that Genki has. I feel like at this point, we've had some time with Genki, but it's mostly over the phone. How do you feel that Genki's actually living up to the sidekick trope, although he's over the phone? He definitely is because, again, they're always in some remote location. In this case, it's Miles' uh, apartment. He lives with the... Did they specify... I don't think they specified why he moved in. I think it's the holidays. So they're on break from school, which is obviously why Miles has so much time on his hand. Okay. And... I think Genki, instead of going vacationing with his family, he moved in with Miles to spend the holidays for the first time. With wow, Miles that's Spence. dedication then. That is a lot of dedication, yeah. He would rather brave the snow <laughs> than go on a sunny vacation. Take a note, Peter, that he didn't go on vacation. When his friend needed him the yeah. most. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... You know, you're absolutely right. Even though Genki, most of our interactions with Genki so far has been over the phone, that is very much man in the chair. I think the reason why we also say man in chair is the fact that it's very generic who's in the chair to a sense. It's very like they're hidden behind the shadows, you know, behind the superhero. And Genki is that he's kind of like unreachable at this point because we we are the superhero. The most important thing I take away from it is being a superhero can really be a tolling thing. It can be hard. It can, you know, cause a lot of maybe mental stress. And even though a lot of superheroes want to protect their loved ones and not tell them their identities, it's maybe important to tell a few people, especially that you're really close to, because you can lean on them when you're going through a nightmare, which is, you know, poor superheroes, nightmares happen constantly. They're, uh, they never can go on vacation for two weeks because they probably have a lot of PTSD going realistically. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's no break for them. And you bring up a good point. It's more of a mental release, I think, uh, an emotional release when they have that person that they could turn to, whether it is while they're, you know, like Miles, while they're swinging around in Manhattan and just having someone just to chat to about anything um, kind of brings you back to the fact that Miles is still just a teenager, right? He's still a kid that wants those social interactions. But instead of going over to his friend's house to play, you know, the latest game, he actually just also has to have this responsibility of watching over the city. And what better way to pass the time in between each battle than just geeking out and talking to your friend? That's what I love most about their relationship. Well said. I got to say, too, if you're going to tell your identity to uh, your best friend, he's got to be ride or die. Yeah. (laughs) They have to be ride or die if they are not. And you guys get into fights a lot or whatever. It could go wrong. Right. And, and, you know, maybe he tells the world your identity or she tells the world your identity. So you got to make sure they're ride or die and they're always going to be by your side. That's a really good lesson, which you would think. Peter Parker would kind of know at this point. Uh, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, I feel like told a, a lot of people, a little too many people, his identity. And some of those people become villains. <laughs> yeah. But oddly enough, they don't go after him while he's Peter Parker. No. They they keep it professional. They do. <laughs> only when, it's, when they're Spider-Man. But you know what? I'm interested, now that you brought that up, I don't want to go on too long here, but it seems like Peter only shares his identity to like mostly the people that he falls in love with or by accident. He never tells like his best friend, like Miles did. He tells Mary Jane, he tells um, Felicia Hardy, he tells Felicia and, and then maybe like Doc Ock knows because it's by accident or whatever, but, or the lizard also, but these are all either villains or his romantic involvements. And I think maybe the most important thing to do is to tell your best friend, unless it's Harry Osborne. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah, we're unless Didn't it's Harry. Harry's the exception. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't tell your best friend. Oh, no. Does that mean that maybe they're setting up something with Genki? Who knows? That's that's a really. Oh, I would hope not. No, I, I really love the relationship between Miles and Genki, and I can't wait to see more of it as we play through the game. 
For more from the both of us, you could follow Nick and myself on Twitter, Instagram, all that social goodness. For Nick, you could find him at Nick Andrade and uh, for myself at this Camco. And for what's coming up next, well... All right, let's make it feel like Christmas dinner in here. Wonder who mom invited. We can't wait to meet an old friend of Miles' past, but that will have to wait until next time on Autosave. Autosave is produced and hosted by Nick Andrade and myself, Camille Selzer Hadaway. The show is also produced by Dylan Wilson. Gameplay and additional elements provided by Chris Zeiser. Executive producer, Clayton Hansler. You can follow the show at Autosave Podcast on Twitter and Autosave Pod on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch. You can subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it right now. And if it happens to be Apple Podcasts, kindly leave us a rating and a review, but only if it's good. Autosave is a Soda original hosted on the Soda Podcast Network.